Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Shop Talk. So tonight, before we get started, we've got a new promo for Data Architecture Day. Data Architecture Day, hosted by the Triangle SQL Server Users Group, is an all-day marathon on topics around data architecture. So that could be relational databases, could be data warehouses, modern data warehousing. Even if we start talking about architecting NoSQL solutions, and also architecting in the cloud. So with those major themes, we are currently looking for uh, sessions. You can learn more, sign up for our call for speakers, which is still open for a few more days, and then register for the event itself, which will be totally free on Twitch, May 16th. So learn more, sign up at meetup.com slash tripass and look for Data Architecture Day. With that advertisement passed, we now have the panel. So tonight with me, to my, I guess that would be my right, that would be Mala Mahadevan. Hi, Mala. Hi, how are you? I am well, I am well. Also, to our bottom right, we have the new TriPass logo. So uh, we've got a new logo, I'm unveiling it tonight. This is the reverse image, which is, a a white North Carolina. The other image, I'll pop back to Data Architecture Day, that's our primary image, which is a uh, blue North Carolina. Oops, so now, back to the panel. We also have, rounding out the, the group tonight, Tom Norman. Hey Kevin, how are you tonight? Fantastic, I've gone from good to fantastic in the course of an introduction. All right, so the way this thing works is if you are in chat and you have questions, drop your questions in. We will prioritize those in a meaningful manner, which means that I'm going to look at them and arbitrarily decide which ones I want to talk about. And if you don't have questions, that's okay. We've got, we've got topics. The one thing I have wanted to hit since we don't have questions in chat just yet one thing that I've wanted to hit is tips for working from home. We have with us an expert on working from home. We also have me and Mala who have been forced to work from home. <laughs> Although Mala, you've, you've done quite a bit of work from home uh, over the I years. I have. Right? Before, before I came to Channel Advisor, um, I worked from home in two different gigs spanning about seven years. So, so I'm quite familiar with it. Um, it has pros and cons like everything else. Um, and I I personally, this is my opinion, I personally don't believe it's right for everybody. Um, although the way the world is going, we may not have a choice there, but I do think some of us function better in a real office among people than we do remotely. That's just, that's just my take on it. Um, and it may evolve to a point when everybody gets used to it over time. But right now, I think, you know, I am personally, I like going into an office if I can. I like interacting with people in person. Um, it's not that, you know, I cannot function otherwise, but that's just how I like it. It's fair. It's fair. That, yeah. And work from home expert, Tom Norman. I've been working from home now five and a half years. Uh, live in North Carolina and the office is in Denver, Colorado. Uh, there is uh, challenges with it, of course, as Mala said, you know, you got the hallway conversations or whatever. Uh, I know that it's gotten, uh, as far as the hallway conversations, et cetera, stuff like that, it, to me, it's gotten a lot better having Slack and having channels and stuff or Teams if you're using Teams or whatever. But it's, um, you know, you do have those type of challenges that basically uh, people might leave you out where you need to be involved um, or should be involved. And sometimes you might not get involved till too late. Um, it all depends upon, I think, really the culture of your company and what they're used to. 
and whether they're used to be having people remote or not. Um, I personally, it took me probably three or four months before I got used to actually working at home. It was like, um, it was def definitely a shock. Now, if I go in, when I ha go to the office, it's a bigger shock to go into the office because I don't seem to get anything done that week that I'm in the office, actually physically going to the office. Uh, so uh, there's a nice part about it is that you can turn people off, you know, and basically, you know, say I'm busy, you know, please don't disturb me for right now so you can get stuff done where if you're in an office, Unless you got a door you can shut. Kevin, I think you've got an, a physical office. Uh, oh, no, you're a cubicle guy, too. Oh, huh? I don't even have a cube. I have I have a dog bone where all of the noises from the floor just echo and, and land right in my area, I guess. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's, uh, actually going back back to the office. I have to wear a headset and either listen to music or something. Uh, because the noise just really distracts me now. So the advantage I've seen with the real office, and this this was actually a problem at both the gigs I was at, is that sometimes you have to talk to people to really explain something. Like you need a decision on something or you need a, somebody's opinion on somebody to weigh in on something and that person may not be, you know, working for you or even on your team, maybe a boss or, a, you know, somebody from another team, somebody who does not technically owe you a very detailed answer. That kind of a conversation works out really easily in person. Like, hey, can I have five minutes of your time? You just sit the person down and say, this is what I want to understand. What do you think? And you make eye contact and you have a conversation like that. You can walk away with some sort of an answer, whereas you keep messaging the person, they're going to get annoyed and turn you off or just say, this is all I have to say. And sometimes that's really hard online. Well, yeah. I, I know the thing yeah. that I, I know the thing that I do a lot of times is um, I won't necessarily message a person back and forth. You know, mm -hmm. if, if it's a one off, if it's a one line thing and then we're done or whatever, then yes. But if it's a conversation or whatever, I actually will pick up Slack or or whatever the tool you may use, Teams or whatever, and we'll get on and talk to each other. And we do a lot of uh, screen sharing. Uh, screen sharing mm. helps out a ton uh, from being able to, uh, like I'm, I, uh, I've got a coworker that's kind of wanting to be a DBA and, and they've given me the green light to train him and he's in Portland and I'm in Raleigh and we are, you know, basically we get on and share screens and stuff. And that's, uh, you know, and it's gotten a lot better uh, over the last couple of years since Slack and Teams and et cetera has. Um, Skype was kind of, yeah, they got, they have that information, but the com communication tools have gotten far, far better. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that you have, you know, but you definitely need to get you, you know, if you're going to work from home long term, you need to get you a good chair uh, that you have. If you want to have a stand up desk, either buy a stand up desk or something you can raise, get the amount of monitors that you need and stuff like that. And then, of course, get you a, uh, a very good and decent um, Internet uh, provider, you know, Got a really, really good internet provider and stuff. Oh, a good internet provider. So not one in North Carolina. Actually, <laughs> my I I love my internet provider. You know, they so. have Google Fiber in some parts, right? Somebody at work actually had it installed. It's not yeah, here. I, it's not in Morrisville, that's for sure. I've had AT and T Fiber for five and a half years and cannot complain at all. Mm. So. The only time I went down is when they did some yard work in the backyard and they cut it in half and mm. and then uh, they actually came and repaired it that same afternoon. So wow, that, so I was surprised at how fast they were out. Yeah, I've, so I, I I have Spectrum and I have mixed feelings on them, mixed in the sense that I hate them, but I also hate everybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the AT&T here totally sucks. I mean, knock on wood, they've been okay. I, 
through this pandemic thing but before that i can't even count how many outages we've had in yeah. the two years uh, here oh it's just horrible so with fiber okay. tom do you have a business account no i don't i actually okay. have a personal account and right, uh what i've what knock, i've learned knock on wood it's it's always been good right okay what i learned was if you have a business account, they respond a lot faster and give you much better service than if you have a personal account. Really? Mm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mine's personal always account. been mine's always been a personal account. So Okay. So Icon Pro mentioned uh I used to work in an open office, which is actually like working from home, to which my mm. response is that's if your home is filled with hyperactive eight year olds. Um so mine is not, and I really enjoy working from home because it is so much quieter. Mm, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and that and that really makes a difference too, is kind of like, what is your home environment like? Like the nice thing about uh, both places I've worked from home, uh, this house and the previous one, I actually have an office. Mm. So mm. as you can see behind me, I shut the door. You know, I can literally, get up the, the main thing from working from home is you've got to really think about uh how much time that you're working because you can turn around and put 10 12 hours in in a hurry yeah, I, that happened to me a lot in my earlier jobs is i yeah. didn't know where to draw the line and i was guilty that i wasn't doing enough it's yeah, really so, weird yeah so so you know it's yeah. I, you know, I've got my set hours that I've, that I've told the office I'm going to be working. And then, uh, of course, you know, we'll have deployments and stuff like that. But I basically have the set hours. And at the set hour, I get up and turn things off and, you know, and uh, turn the computer off and walk away and shut the door and don't come back in. So, so you've got to, you've also got to be very, very careful about your work-life balance because, you could be a workaholic, a worse workaholic than maybe what you already are. Yes. That is true. <laughs> so Solomon mentions that Tom clearly does not have kids running around. Probably not even the grandkids right now. Uh, he says, no, my, my grandkids are 15 and 16. So, okay. That'll so yeah, they'll, they'll come knock on the door for things every once in a while, you know, and, you know, and, Hey, can you get me this or that or whatever? But you know, it's sometimes it's a nice, it's no more than a distraction than um, what it would be someone coming up my desk. But yeah, Solomon, if you've got like a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, or even an eight or nine-year-old, then I think the answer is yes yeah. to all of those. <laughs> yeah, if you if you got young kids, then established office where you can shut the door then yeah you'd be in trouble i i really like the the savings you get by way of time like not having a commute uh, being able to go get a bite to lunch in your own house um, those things are really awesome uh except that if you like to snack too much and you snack because you you get stressed then you got the kitchen right next door and that's a problem because you gain weight <laughs> So, uh, so since we talked about Slack and Teams, the Duke and he had a question of who is using Teams and how do you find it? Well, it's Microsoft Teams, so you should be able to Google it and find it. I think in the latest edition of Windows, I think they're bringing it down to you automatically. There was some patch I heard that they were automatically installing it, one of the last patches. Uh, we used it for a while, about a year ago, year and a half ago, and we had a vote between using Slack and Teams, and we stayed with Slack. You know, mm -hmm. we found that Slack had more uh, capabilities. Now, that was a year ago, so a lot of things, a lot of bridge under the water. I'm sure Microsoft has... Uh, they're, they're currently chasing Slack, and then I'm sure that they'll catch up and stuff, but um, I think the vast majority of people are still on Slack versus Teams. Yeah, I'm, I tend to use both. Um, I have some Teams stuff, some uh, Slack stuff, and 
I'm okay with teams as a whole. I think they've got a few of their things have been done really well. I think the chat works okay. Um, screen sharing works really well. The interactivity portion they've got down. The problem is that if you have more than one account, the desktop application forces you to sign out and sign in for each account. And that is a really awful experience, especially considering that on mobile, you can switch between them and it's slow, but it's okay. In Slack, I can switch between things. It doesn't even matter what my underlying account is. I just have different Slack channels so, or different Slack instances. And that's what Teams ought to be, where it doesn't matter what my underlying email address is, what my underlying account is, they're all me. But, you know, one is work me, one is corporate me, one is uh, user group Secret me. Secret user group me. Yeah, yeah, personal me. They're all me. And it yeah. should just be one thing. And yet it's not right. one thing. I think that's one of the most painful things about Microsoft Teams. And once they fix that, it's a pretty good experience. Mm. Uh, what's the, what is the use case for multiple Microsoft accounts? Oh, that's easy. Uh, so I have, I have a job. My job has an email address. Let's say that I work at a company where we're using Teams. I'm gonna have an email address for that. And I'll, I'll be in some Azure Active Directory domain. So I log in as that. And then I have a personal account. And I've got you know friends of mine, or let's say we were coordinating on Teams. Uh, we actually coordinate on Slack, but same difference. We coordinated on teams i'm not going to use that corporate email account because well if i leave the job kind of screw mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's why i would have multiples well and then i actually have my sql you know account so i can mm -hmm. keep my sql stuff uh away from my personal stuff i have that too. yeah yeah because you know I've, i get an uh you know if you become really active within the community you're going to get a lot of I'm gonna call it noise, but it's not really noise, but you know, it kind of, you know, and then if if you get out in the speaking engagement and you, you know, and people, you don't wanna necessarily give them your personal account, you give them your yeah. SQL account to actually contact you and mm -hmm. and, um, and ask questions and stuff. So, right. Yeah, like the, the experience in Slack is just utterly transparent where I could look at my Slack listing and say, I don't even know which account I use to sign up for this because it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, lo I love it with Slack. Yeah. 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 Whereas with yeah. with Teams, it's like, oh, you signed in with this email address. Well, you can see these Teams groups, but oh, you want the other ones? Well, you have to sign out and sign back in. Yeah, but and that's the that's the beauty too. You know, I, I like Slack from the standpoint of you know we've got our user group Slack. You know that we we started. You know, we've got, you know, the, the SQL community has one. The only drawback about the SQL community one is that they don't have the paid version. So you you lose after, what, 10,000 messages or whatever, you lose the information. Yeah. So. But. Uh, so sometimes you can have multiple instances of an app open in Windows by shift clicking. Can you not do that with Teams? I don't think you can. The workaround that I have seen is that if you sign in through the web browser, you can have multiple Chrome instances and uh, use those multiple Chrome instances, multiple Chrome profiles to connect to different Microsoft Teams workspaces. And this is actually a really big problem if you're a consultant, where uh, if I have four or five clients, all of which are using Teams. Yeah, I may have five separate accounts because each one's gonna give me an email address for that company. And they don't want me necessarily mixing my Active Directory domain for my consulting firm with their Active Directory domains. So it, it turns out to be a pretty big mess that people get around with Chrome profiles uh, or multiple browsers. Hmm. So uh, what else should we think about with working from home? I, I have noticed that there was a big burst of meetings the first couple of weeks. 
where it seemed like everybody just had to have meetings to make sure that people knew that they were still working? Well, some of that is still going on. It's just that people realized um, at two, two of those that I was on, they didn't realize how bad the privacy issues were and we had, you know, bad stuff happen. I just leave it at that. So most people have taken it offline and, you know, deeming each other, hey, we're getting on and we're going to chat and that's how it's happening currently. There are one or two that are still public, but most are going on just in the network. But they're all going on, that's for sure. Anyone is interested, if you want a SQL Hangout, then let us know. I'll be happy to share details of that. Okay, yeah. Those assuming, are, assuming the host is okay with it. Right, those are separate Hangouts. This is this is going back more to the work discussion of meetings at work. Oh, where, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, where we had, yeah. a, I think a lot of companies had just a slew of just, uh, virtual meetings constantly. And so, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. How do you how do you deal with that? Either of you and your twelve plus years of combined work from home experience. Well, the the interesting part was is you know prior to us doing that major release about a month ago, a little over a month ago, uh, the amount of meetings I was in on a daily basis would be five to six hours a day. It seems like. It was just like back to back to back to back meetings. And, you know, you you eventually, you know, you either have to determine, do you really need to be in that meeting and they can call you in if they really need you? Or if you need to be in there just for from a database perspective for the database oversight that sometimes a project needs to have. Um, you know, so so you you have to kind of weigh it. The the nice thing about uh, at least the meetings I was in with them, they would do them on Slack or go to meeting. Is I could start it up on one screen and I could actually be multitasking and kind of listening for my name or you know Tom, what do you think or whatever. Uh, so it's not like I uh, would be actually in a meeting conference room to where that, okay, I can't really work and do anything else. I'm just stuck in a meeting and, and I'm, you know, losing product productivity. Right. Yeah. I would agree with everything Tom said there. And especially the last one I've been doing quite, that quite a bit at work. It's just sometimes um, I turn off the camera and I just keep working until I hear my name mentioned or somebody wants me, um, Otherwise, I just keep doing my work and doesn't bother me very much. There's some background conversation. I know that's not for everyone, but for as long as the meeting lasts, you know, okay, if you want me there, I'll stay there. And usually, and this is very company specific, usually where, where I'm at, um, we don't have unnecessary meetings a whole lot. If, if there is a meeting, then there is a reason for a person to be in it. Otherwise, most people try to do without them. Well, my problem as a DBA, they would you know, they go, he needs to be in the meeting. When most of the time throughout the entire meeting, I had nothing really to contribute. So, you know, or, or even to say or whatever, but, but I did find that it was sometimes if I wasn't there and they were doing something really not smart from a database perspective, then without me being there, it'd be trouble. You know, yeah. Like like making a, a good, a clustered key, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, got a got a link in chat about the most asked thing in user voice. Actually, I think it's the most asked thing in user voice at all which was uh, multiple Teams accounts at the same time. Basically, my rant, I'm not the only person who had that uh, that problem. And they said back in December they're working on it. It's going out in phases. So one of these years, it'll be out. Oh, definitely. The, the Microsoft Teams is going to be uh, probably equivalent to Slack within a year, probably. Uh, they have more users, is what I hear. Yeah. That it's it's already bigger in that regard. 
isn't it um, skype like um, yeah it's replacing my understanding it is replacing my understanding is going to replace skype yeah that's my thought too. skype skype for yeah. business yeah 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 okay um so if there are any other questions or comments about working so a friend home, of mine was asking kevin uh mm -hmm. what do people think of uh, online interviewing both sides it's like as an interviewer and as an interviewee are you comfortable interviewing someone just online and making an offer or as an interviewee, are you just comfortable accepting it? My short answer is yes to both. Mm -hmm. uh, I have I have interviewed people. Um, so company that Mala and I work for, we have an office in Madrid. I've interviewed people for that office that I've, uh, that I had not seen in person. We just had basically, Skype or Teams or some Google Hangouts or something where, um, uh-oh, lost sound. So Icon Pro, let me know if the sound does not come back. If you're still having problems even after a refresh, um, my microphone says it's still going, so who knows? I can still hear you too, so it's got to be him. I can hear you. Okay, well, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, we've Okay. So yeah, Icon Pro, I'd say refresh. Maybe maybe uh you didn't pay your Twitch bill. Um I don't I don't know. It's, uh hopefully a refresh solves it for you. So, we've hired people without me seeing the person face to face. Ah, Twitch for Android. Okay. Interesting. Um without seeing these people you can still get a pretty good idea because you're able to do technical questions. You're still able to do the conversational points. I understand the desire to want to meet a person in person and pick up clues, but if you have a good process for hiring, mm -hmm. then I don't think you have to be in person. Uh, as an interviewee, one of the big advantages I have to being in person is I can go and see what the office looks like. I can try to see as, as I'm being walked to a room, you know, if I'm going through the area, then right. uh, am I going to, like, what, are the, what does the area look like? And I've mm -hmm. turned down job offers because I walked through, I was like, this is an open office where it's not even it's not even dog bones. It's just here's a a table with a little stand that's probably about that tall, where you can sit see over the to the next person, and you're out in the open with a bunch of other people all around you. Nope, do not want. <laughs> yeah, that would be hard. Yeah, I, I would not ask. like that. Yeah, I know yeah, it's so hard. As far as I go of interviewing people, interviewing people that are remote or whatever, I really don't have a problem, even technical or whatever, because especially if uh, when I interview and we interview DBAs and stuff, we've interviewed them more of a, a situation and how do you how how do you handle that situation? I'm not asking you commands because if you can talk your way through the situation you most likely already know the commands of doing it. And I don't have to figure out that you're sitting there, you know, typing Google and say, how do I do this? Or how do I do that as, I, as I'm doing it? Um, but, Although that's uh, happened to me once. Yeah. And, I had a candidate who was cheating like that, but just yeah. once. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then if I'm interviewing for a company, I, I personally do want to go to that company and see basically, is it a good culture fit also, Kevin? I agree with you. I kind of want to walk through, meet the people, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of get a feel for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I asked to come in at your agenda. I said, I want to come in and they, they said they'd get back to me after that. They said, you seem to know a lot of people here, so we don't think this is necessary. 
<laughs> you can ask them whatever you wish to ask. <laughs> right. So that's right. that. Yeah, but that's not everywhere. And in, in you know, in a normal situation, I'd like to come and go and see the office too. Oh yeah, it's, it, it's going to be interesting now that we basically everybody's been kind of forced to work from home. Right. How, how much that this is going to kind of flip, and maybe is it going to get where? You know, I've always thought that a shared desk scenario. Uh, would be smart from a company's financial resources standpoint to say that have you come in three days a week and your your desk partner come in two days a week and vice versa every other week, you know, uh, something like that to see how much they'd save money. Because like my company does not pay for my, for example, my internet connection. I pay for my internet connection. Hmm. I have to find this um, as we as we go on. Okay. So when I interview people, I like to see them. I like the person to turn on the camera for one thing. I know some, but uh, in a job interview, I think it's really important. Correct. Agree that the panel is able to see you, you know, sitting with your hands in, in front of the table and not not too far apart. Let's see, I'm only I'm only going to have this up long enough to get a copyright complaint. There we go. <laughs> so this is what I thought about when uh, Tom was explaining uh, his idea of hoteling. Um, it's. It's a very old Dobert ca uh, cartoon, but it actually kind of sums up why I don't like the shared office space that much. And <laughs> uh, that is that, you know, I like to have my own stuff. Um, I like to have you know my own chair. I like to know that nobody else is going to sit in my chair. Yeah. That I can keep my things where they're at and you know nobody's going to open my desk and take my cough drops or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, are, yeah. It is true. I'm a very possessive guy that way. Now, if, if I were working completely remote, that's a different story. It's okay. You come in two weeks a year and you're working in the office for two, one week periods in a year. Take whatever desk they have. You don't really have that mm -hmm. much in the way of a, of a choice. Actually three times a year. So, Three times a year for you? Yeah, three times a year, once a week, one week. So after working from home now, you know, five and a half years, I don't know whether I would want to go back to an office environment. That's what most people say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, got some dislike for open offices. By the way, is it? I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, is it the Duke NY or the Duke any, or how would you like me to pronounce it? Uh, while that question is out there, dislike of open office, also thinking about sharing all those germs by sharing the same desk. Yeah, that's that's a factor. I just hate the noise in open offices. I, if you want If you want productivity, you don't put people in an open office. That's just my general philosophy on things. Not when you have to think. If yeah. if you're widget pushing, uh, you you're doing the the Duke NY. Okay, I'll I'll uh, switch out to that. But if you're George Jetsoning, where your entire job is like to push a button over and over over the course of a day, then I can see putting you on a field with thousands of other George Jetsons. But if you actually have to think and converse with people, open offices are. Yeah, yeah. Also, like um, you have situations mm. where you have to tell somebody something without a ton of people looking at it or listening in. I mean, it's just that you know, I want this code promoted early, or you know, this person's thing is not working, or it's just it's going to create a ton of politics if everybody is reading everything you say to somebody else and misinterpretation of what you're saying. 
um, I don't think there should be some room for some minimal privacy in what conversations you're having with your boss or your colleagues or whoever that might be, I think. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I worked in Europe uh, for 18 months, the office I worked in was kind of a more of an open office type of thing. Mm -hmm. Literally, you know, I could look over my monitor and see the uh, employee on the other side of the desk, you know, that we faced each other and stuff. And then I had an employee literally right to, I happened to be against a wall, or otherwise I had, I would have had an employee to my right and left, but concern was against the wall, I only had one, one employee, but, but yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a different concept and takes a little getting used to if you're going to do an open office type of scenario. Not the best for pro productivity for sure. Yeah, Solomon mentioned mm -hmm. multiple studies. Open offices tend to be less productive. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The good part about mine was at least I was around a bunch of uh, systems guys, hardware guys. So they were constantly getting up and go working with the hardware and stuff. So, and it would leave me there. So I wouldn't be, you know, with them that, you know, that much and stuff, but still. Right. All right. I think we've beat that dead horse <laughs> enough. Uh, although if there are questions in chat, uh, have at them. In the meantime, something from Chris Voss that Chris sent me a little while ago. I just haven't had a chance to, to bring it up here. And that is that his team is starting the use of containers for local environments to test database development before deploying to, shared dev, uh, to a shared dev environment. Can anyone share their container strategies? And what are the space considerations for local sandboxes? Would it make more sense to put an entire application code base in the same container? So there's a few things to tease out of that. Um, well, the, the one, Kevin, that that I would ask on, and, and really, when I really started looking at, we actually, at our shop, basically every developer has a copy of the obfuscated production databases. And that's literally when they're expanded, you're probably looking about 500 gigs. Yeah, you know, so it's a pretty good size. So my question was when I first heard of containers, I was like going, wow, great. I can just put it all together and then do it. And then all of a sudden I was like going, and someone goes, yeah, the container is still going to be 485 gig that you're going to be passing around versus, you know, all the different databases at various sizes, right? So I was like going, when I heard about a year ago, two years ago, to where now you can basically have the container of just the engine and you can have a disk where the databases would be. I was like going, okay, now it's really getting pretty smart and stuff. So, uh, but the question is that we brought up, Kevin, before we got on was, now you're talking about Linux versus Windows, you know, mm -hmm. and that's where I still think the rubber meets the road is we're a total Windows shop. We don't have any Linux people to deal mm. with it. Yep. And as Icon Pro points out, uh, Windows containers are a hot mess. Avoid those. So that's a little bit of my editorializing <laughs> on top that's of that. But yeah, they're avoid Windows containers for sure. It's Linux or bust. Uh, well, you can, you can sell I, I me know, on BSD. I, I, I did a trial run earlier last year, and we were looking at purchasing it, and, and very well still may. Uh, there is a third-party product that does Windows containers, in my opinion, very well, and they worked very well. We actually had a developer uh, working against it. Um, there's the, the company's Windox. You know, I know, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes they really um, might rub some people ro the wrong way or whatever, but they they really worked very well for us. Um, yeah. And stuff. So, uh, Windox. But, so, my uh, statements about avoiding Windows containers aside, Windox has gone a long way toward making Windows containers viable. And yes, they have. Before yeah. Docker officially supported Windows containers, WinDocs was the only game in town. They were the way that you were going to get there. 
it's still something I would avoid in any type of environment. Now, this is different, mind you. What I'm talking about is uh, using uh, Windows as your container guest operating system as opposed to Windows as your host operating system. Right. So Windows as your host operating system, I, it's okay. It's not as good as just running straight up in Linux. But as the Duke NY points out with uh, Windows subsystem for Linux 2, you no longer have the need for Hyper-V in your container world. So you don't need to go from Windows to virtual Linux to containerized Linux. You can go straight from Windows to containerized Linux. So that gets rid of a lot of the costs of virtualization and makes Windows a more viable option for, for those types of containers. What um, what version, Kevin, was that, that that Windows just have, is it released now that's got the Linux kernel in, built into it to do that? So uh, that's WSL2, and I believe, yes, actually it is on the main line at this point, I think, for Windows 10. Pretty is sure it 1909? Do you know? Might be 1909. It, it might be the next one after that. I I would have to look that up. Um, I know that insiders were able to get it. The insider ring had it for a couple months. I'm pretty sure I've seen it on one of my computers in the most recent updates. But um, between that and the newest version of Docker for desktop, you can get rid of Hyper-V. That would so, be sweet. That's that's pretty helpful. Now, container strategies. Tom mentioned that containers are not going to save you disk space on net. And that's completely true. If you have a 500 gigabyte database that you need to share out to everybody, it's still going to be 500 gigabytes even if it's containerized. Where the So my go on, go on, Kim. Oh, where the benefit comes in containers is not so much in saving space. I can tell you where you will save space, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. The benefit to containers is more of the ability to uh, modify and then tear down and rebuild without much in the way of consequence. So I can, for say integration testing. I can spin up a copy of, of Tom's containerized database, hammer it with all kinds of mutating queries, things that update data, things that delete data, processes, month-end processes. And when I'm done with it, trash that. Next time I need to run those tests, I have the same copy of data that I had before. So I don't have to worry about, are all of my scripts item potent? Do I have the ability to restore back to where I was after doing all of my work? I mean, we can. there are ways that we can do that. We can take database snapshots. Uh, we can write scripts that will go and clear out data. But, you know, these things, database snapshots have their downsides in terms of space utilization. So that's, that's what I get confused about is that databases are stateful entities. Yes. Yep. Yep. So databases are stateful, containers are intended to be stateless or right. or temporary state. Right. So yeah, if you have a an essentially an item potent situation, like like testing, um, that's really good for containers. If you have a production database, it's less good for containers. There are persistent volumes. So I can have my actual SQL Server MDF, NDF, LDF files living on a share on the host and the containers pick it up and say, oh, I'm now going to attach uh, these data files and hydrate them as databases in my container. There's a lot less benefit, but even there, there's still benefit because I can very easily upgrade versions of SQL Server because all I have to do is grab the latest image. I've now upgraded. So 
spin down the old one, spin up the new one, reattach, let it upgrade the databases, and I'm back online. I don't have to take it down for a restart. I don't have to take it down for the 10 minutes that it might take to uh, install a CU. So there are some benefits. And where you can save in storage is less of the 500 gigabyte database example and more of if you have a lot of different components or different products that all share the same set of components, you can definitely save with layered images. So for example, you may have 30 different .NET applications. They're all running .NET Core. Uh, they're all running a lot of your same DLLs, but they all have their own different DLLs. They all have their own different methods of operation. All of that stuff that's common can be saved one time in your image repository, and that's where you can save a reasonable amount of disk space because you don't need 35 copies of .NET Core installed. You just need the one copy, and then uh, each subsequent container can reference that image. So that's where you end up saving disk space in the, in the longer run. But if you have a more flat distribution model where you just need everybody to have this big thing, you're not going to save space with a container. Uh, last question there was putting an entire application code base in the same container as your database. I would say probably not. My recommendation no. is, yeah, you wouldn't do that on a real server, so you probably shouldn't do it in a container. Have different containers. Have, uh, yeah, have different containers and have them communicate with each other as though they were just independent servers that were hosting your application and your database. Okay. Yeah, you would you would never do that on a server, so you should never do that in a on a container either. So, how does containerization play with Azure Arc? Azure Arc um, relies heavily on containerization and Kubernetes, and I'm not going to get too far into detail on Arc because. Every time I hear a talk about it, it's either NDA or my eyes glaze over. Um, not from complexity, but more from more from uh, just haven't had a need to do anything with it yet. So I will remain purposefully vague here so that I don't accidentally say something I shouldn't say. But uh, with Azure Arc, the whole idea is that I can take my Azure portal experience, if I'm if I'm running uh, virtual machines in Azure, if I'm hosting things in Azure, I'm working with containers with Azure Kubernetes service, I've got the experience of tagging and billing off of that. And then I can replicate some of that experience on-prem or with other clouds. So that's the goal of Azure Arc. And the idea is that the ideal is to try to get some types of set of services that are roughly cloud neutral, where I could spin up this thing, like this SQL Server instance, and it doesn't really matter where I spin it up. It could be my local on-prem on -prem cloud. Uh, it could be in Azure, could be AWS, could be Google, but you could manage it the same way using this command interface. So containerization is extremely important there because that's how they're going to be able to ensure that the same bits can work on every platform. So we had a question from Mark. And in regard to concern of sharing data outside of your shop, should you, or what are your thoughts on disabling telemetry? So the SQL Server telemetry. I will share my thoughts at the end. Question mark. Yeah, that was, uh, I would fail at Jeopardy. Would you, would you actually in the telemetry, or where is your telemetry? Is it up in Azure or, or where, where is your telemetry? 
every installation of SQL Server has a telemetry service. Okay. Solomon has a very strong opinion. I would actually be interested to hear Solomon's opinion. Uh, On-prem, yeah, okay. So, yeah, I wanna, I'm, I'm actually interested in seeing if Solomon can type fast enough for me to be able to uh, relay that to everybody, but... Well, yes, I... <laughs> what, it depends upon if you're sharing your database with someone else, you know, it's, you know, what data is actually in there. And like, for example, you probably wouldn't want to share your entire customer database with someone else. But as far as telemetry on how the system runs and, you know, the performance of it and stuff like that, I don't know whether it's going to, you know, I'd have to think about it, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head quickly that it would hurt. Yeah, so in particular, this is the uh, SQL Server telemetry service and is something that Microsoft installs as part of SQL Server where they will collect information on utilization of different parts of the product. Oh, that particular part. Okay, so that's what he's asking about. Okay. So I actually I actually think personally, you know, some people say no way I'm not going to share the information with Microsoft. You know, and then the question is is if they're not pulling um your data then and just looking at what parts of the system you're using, for example, service broker you know it's like how many people are actually using service broker you know is it i personally think it helps to make the product better you know for them to know you know do i put more time and upgrade capabilities into this or that yeah yeah um and that is definitely how it's being used so For do some... you hear anything how they actually use this data Sorry, Mala, say again? No, I was asking, do you actually hear case studies of how they use this data? Because I haven't heard of anything. I think I've actually heard a couple of times, not directly, but you know, you'll sometimes hear or see when people are, um, you know, whether, whether they're doing anything basically to upgrade that part of the system and stuff. Yeah, I, I had to make that face that I did because um, I don't want to say anything wrong. Uh, the short answer is that, yes, they definitely use the information in telemetry to make decisions and also to understand how people are using the product. So you can trace uh what the telemetry service is doing you can look because it it is running under its own account so um but the other part kevin what about what about these third-party monitoring tools these third-party monitoring tools like quest and century one and and others that you know that uh like century one's just now going into the cloud but quest has been up there for a little while and you can actually pull telemetry to basically say how many people are on 2008 R2 and how many people are on 2005 and how many people are on 2012 and and you know and that type of information that you know that they gather of you know who's upgrading and when they're upgrading and how far back the process is and stuff like that so Yeah, yeah. And also one thing I should point out is that uh, just because the queries run doesn't mean that Microsoft gets the data. A lot of this is also held locally and may not actually be sent up or may be sent up in a different manner. So and they may not ask for it until you call, you know, the support desk and all of a sudden they have you run a couple of things so you can send stuff so they can see what it's what it's doing what the system's doing 
right um that that is a factor it's less for telemetry telemetry is just more of kind of an ongoing thing um i'm going to link in the show notes to uh brent ozar post where brent went kind of ballistic about the idea i'm not really that concerned personally uh i don't know i I have just enough information to have a very, very, very vague notion of what's going on. And that that notion is like, yeah, I collect telemetry for applications I write as well. Uh, it's a very, it's quite useful for getting detailed information like Tom was mentioning. How many people are using Service Broker in the wild? How many people are using this, this feature and it will help them prioritize products later on because I can go out and say, hey, I think Polybase is a great thing, but if nobody goes out and uses Polybase, then they're not gonna spend a lot of time on Polybase even with me telling them, oh, everybody I know is using Polybase because they can go to their data and say, nope, seven people have turned it on, six people turned it back off. Uh, Those aren't real numbers, hopefully. Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, as all of us as software developers, we basically go, wow, there's, this is this great idea. It's like we was talking about, like last week, we was talking about StretchDB, for example. How many people turned on StretchDB? And the thing of it is, is maybe if they see the telemetry that nobody's using it because it's too expensive, then maybe they will lower the cost so they can get people to adopt it um you know and stuff like that so it's a matter of um we may think we built this beautiful rocket ship that people everybody should use but in reality we're wrong you know so telemetry i think we even pulled telemetry on our website and stuff of what's being used and what's not being used yeah yeah it's i mean i understand the trickiness of the the debate because i think there is there is a debate um and i think that that debate is reasonable it's not like there is no anti-telemetry argument there certainly is and that that argument is that hey i have confidential information in here um i have agreements that i've signed with these companies and that includes not letting that information out of here Correct. Thinking about thinking about a GDPR world, uh, that makes telemetry not impossible, but it would be nice. It would be nicer if Microsoft were a little bit more explicit about what they include in telemetry. If they if they didn't hide everything behind the, mm-hmm. the wall That's of what do, yeah. We're not going to tell anybody anything about it, and uh, you shouldn't even think about it. Just, just go on with your life. <laughs> well, don't they? Don't they now? It's automatically turned on 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 the oh, newer yeah. versions. As yeah. of SQL Server 2016. Yeah. So it is on by default, and I think in Azure, I don't know if you can turn it off. For platform as a service for the virtual machines i believe you can uh, for on-prem you can but for their platform as a service stuff now i mean there that you're definitely not going to turn off because they need that information as well yeah so i would like to see them be a little bit more open about what they're showing will be a little bit more open about how they use the data uh, and to show that, yeah, we're not really collecting anything scary, uh, but they don't do that. And I think that uh, feeds into some of the concern of, well, I don't want anybody to see any information, so it's insecure. It's un- it's unsafe. Which I think it takes it a bit too far. So corporate environments, the bigger ones especially, you start getting into uh, concerns of, oh, well, this service, this service sends information over the Internet, so it's it's unsafe. 
And that'll kill up an initiative immediately. That's Which true. I th think happens with Mark. I think Mark said the, the large enough company size where that kind of thing happens. Well, well it's interesting that uh, now with uh, all of us being remote and all that kind of stuff, guess what we're all using? Yep. The internet. <laughs> so. Oh, don't worry. This is all safe. Yeah. Right. Remember the time when you needed somebody to refer you to get a Gmail account? <laughs> That's how I got mine. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend who had one. I'm like, could you could you submit me for one, please? <laughs> uh, it was a good time. Because before that, it was all Hotmail and Yahoo Mail. Right. All right. So we are at the top of the hour. Thanks, everybody, for your questions tonight. Show notes are going to be posted tomorrow. Uh, this will also be posted tomorrow, so you'll see this on YouTube. Before I leave you all for tonight, let me once again push Data Architecture Day, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group, Saturday, May 16th, all day. I don't know what all day is yet. It'll depend on how many sessions there are. But expect many sessions, right. by many, at least five or six, maybe more. Depends on how long I want to stay awake. You can learn more. You can sign up, meetup.com slash tripass. We, uh, we have a meetup there for Data Architecture Day. We also have a link to the call for papers. So we're looking for speakers for Data Architecture Day. If you have a talk on a topic of architecture, be that relational, Warehousing, modern data warehousing, cloud architecture, all of the above. Of yeah. Come talk to us by going to our call for speakers and entering in your information. So call for speakers is open for about another week. And then we're going to close it up, build out our schedule, and have more information for everybody then. So thanks again for stopping by. Hope to see Hi, you again. Kevin. Tomorrow we have... Jess Borland Schultz, she is going to talk about Azure Data Engineering. So come on down for that as well. That starts at going to be probably 6.30 p.m. I better check the schedule to make sure I show up on time. Hey, so, Kevin. Yes. One other thing is to let people know is that uh, April 25th this week, uh, Richmond, uh, Virginia is having their virtual SQL Saturday. I think it's the first one they're actually having, I think, it is. Uh, a few sessions. Yep. That, so SQLSaturday.com. Also, a summit, summit call for speakers ends this Wednesday on the 23rd. There's so if anyone's lot. looking to submit, please, please consider because we really need more speakers there. Yep. Okay. So recapping, Data Architecture Day, submit a session for that. Uh, SQL Saturday, Richmond. This Saturday, it is the first virtual SQL Saturday. Uh, yes, Solomon, past summit call for speakers is still open until Wednesday. And they just announced their pre-cons today. So you could see who will do pre-cons for summit 2020. But SQL Saturday, Richmond, the first virtual SQL Saturday. Everybody can be in Richmond without being in Richmond. <laughs> I would prefer to be in Richmond. It's a nice city. But... Yes. That's upcoming as well. So can I make a list for these events? Yes. Check uh, the show notes. I'll have those notes in there. And just one question, Kevin, as we close, are you going to go get your victory burrito after you do your session in, in Richmond? That's a tough question. I I might, but you could I've, enjoyed, <laughs> I've enjoyed not leaving the house. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, just wondering, you know, because you I always might. get your victory burrito. You know, I may I may go get some tortillas this weekend and just uh, make a victory burrito. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right, everybody. Thank you again for popping in. See you all soon.